Welcome to Welcome to the Hollowell Manor. I'm Max. And I'm Tina. And we're here to discuss Season 3, Episode 8 of Charmed. Sleuthing with the Enemy. Okay, so I really, really like this episode. This is, I think, probably my favorite episode of Charmed. I would argue that it may be the best episode of Charmed. But what is with that title? Oh, please. All the Charmed titles are like that. I know. We can't get into it every time. But In like... fact, I kind of feel like... I want to start working on a theory about the inverse quality of title naming, where the worse the title is, the better the episode is, except that Womb Raider is not the best episode. Yes, but it is the worst title. But yeah, this is, I think, I think this is my favorite episode of Charmed. Okay, so when we record episodes, I leave it all out on the field. Hmm. So... I'd have to go back and listen to our podcast to think about which one is my favorite one. I liked this episode, but I, I think, I think All Hallowell's Eve, I, I, I like better still. The time, yeah, the one where they go back in time and uh, deliver Melinda Warren. Yes, exactly. Uh, see, that one's really strong. It's just, it has the Leo and Daryl subplot. Yeah, yeah. See, that, that's what I'm talking about. Like, that's the kind of thing I excise from my memory after we record. Remember they have the weird juke flip thing? Yeah. I mean, which, the subplot isn't terrible, but it, uh, for me, that's kind of what takes it away from being, like, the top episode. It's a top tier episode. Yeah, we should do a tier listing of our episodes when we finish seasons. Yeah. That's a good idea. We should do that. But I can We can put it up as a, a thing on our YouTube channel. By the way, we have a YouTube channel. Yes, we do have a YouTube channel. If that is your preferred method of listening to podcasts, you can you can do that. So, I think the same thing in All Hallwell's Eve that makes it your favorite episode is kind of what makes this episode my favorite episode, in that it's kind of what I wish Charmed was all the time. Oh, yeah. Because this episode, you know, it does this really good job combining kind of the wry humor that Charmed has a lot of the time Mm -hmm. it's like this really good slice of life you know it does a good job balancing the whole slice of life regular person thing with the high drama witch stuff like it's hokey but in a fun way it's uh i'm trying to think of ways to say this that don't sound kind of double-edged but because you know i keep saying you know cheesy and stuff but the thing is this episode really leans into being a genre show yeah, and it's, it's, this is an episode where it's about the witchcraft. I, I feel like we can chart, like, when the show gets away from its witchcraft roots, and, and it starts just becoming excuses to put the girls in skimpy costumes. Plus, this is building off continuity, which, you know how much we love continuity. We love a good continuity. And it's doing such a good job, they remember, <laughs> this sounds like... It sounds like such low expectation stuff, but they remembered what happened and they followed up on it. Right? Also, heavy, heavy coal episode, which is definitely in the episode's favor. Oh, I do love coal. It's, it seems, it seems bad. It seems anti-feminist to think that the best thing about Charmed is coal, but I I don't don't know what to do with that. I, I, it's kind of like in the other two. Where, uh, hating individual women is not anti-feminist. Yes. You don't have to like every woman. Not that I hate any of the Charmed Sisters, but... No. You know what I mean. Yes. So, speaking of the kind of cool traditional witchcraft we want to see more of in this show, Mm -hmm. we start with, uh, Prue and Piper brewing a vanquishing potion, and we've seen them make vanquishing potions before... But God, I just, I love this setup because you see all of the different herbs on the table. They've got kind of this cauldron looking pot. Like, there are all of these signifiers that make this, you know, witchy, witch. Yeah. uh, Prue tells Piper that the next ingredient is cockles. And when Piper asks where they are, Prue says they're over there next to the crickets. And, uh, and 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 then, and then Piper says, what are they? And Prue says they're tiny little bugs that chirp. <laughs> Again, wry humor, which works so well for this show. And it's usually kind of Piper's ballywick, but all of the sisters can do it. Prue, 
And Prue doesn't really have her own identity anymore, so, well, like, it's fine that she's getting in on it. Also, I am I mean, it's not great. Piper should know what stuff is. She used to be a chef, but... Yeah, remember in season seven of Buffy when Willow is like, what's the plural of chrysalises? And it's like, season one, Willow would have known. It's chrysalis. Hmm. Yeah, Piper's kind of moved away from that. She's very squeamish about working with the kind of stuff you would be working with if you were a chef in a high-end restaurant, which is what she was. Right. So, well, I mean, I guess I guess that makes sense since she hasn't cooked in who knows how long. Mm. Now, I don't want to be bringing you down by complaining about an episode that you love. Go for it. But Piper and Prue talk about how it's very important that they follow the recipe for this potion to a T. This is the potion to banish Balthazar, by the way, that they've been talking about for the last few episodes. Mm. And Piper forgets to put the Balthazar flesh in there. Like, come on! I mean, spoiler alert, it kind of doesn't matter. It's true. But yes, Piper did forget the most important ingredient. And Prue changes the subject by starting to talk about how much she doesn't like Cole and how she doesn't trust Cole. And hey, remember how Cole got caught in that demon trap that one time? Maybe maybe we should follow up on that some. But then she has to change the subject back to Balthazar. Back to Balthazar. (laughs) Because Phoebe has entered the room. Oh, and then they just throw the flesh in there. Like, is this an exacting recipe where you have to add things at certain times or not? Is this cooking or baking? Exactly. Because cooking, you can you can do whatever you want, basically. But baking is basically chemistry. Yeah. So we cut from that to a funeral, specifically just to set the scene that we are in a graveyard. And we see Balthazar is bleeding. He's affected. Because remember, he got that piece of flesh sliced away at the end of the last episode yeah piper cut a big chunk out of his abdomen last episode and he is being hunted because as you may or may not remember he murdered the shit out of the triad who were you know that they were they were the source's right hand men they were the most powerful demons except for the source and they they all got taken out by cole when he had a sucking chest or gut wound I mean, it wasn't, it was, a sucking chest wound is a wound that pierces the lungs, but, you know. Yes. A gaping. A gaping gut wound. Yes. And he took them all out in his human form, which this episode goes to some lengths to establish is weaker than his demon form. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense to me. A, a, a person who loves She-Hulk comics, that makes total sense to me. I do like how later in the show, uh, Cole's human form kind of way outpaces balthazar and then he just never turns into balthazar again because why would you if your human form is stronger and has better powers why would you if your human form is julian mcmahon Mm. so i was gonna say cult balthazar balthazar is hiding out in this mausoleum and a demon bounty hunter is after him yeah since the triad has been killed by cole the entire underworld is out for his head okay Okay, this episode is called Sleuthing with the Enemy because the Charmed Ones are going to end up working with this demon to to try to get Cole because it's like an enemy of my enemy is my friend type of thing. Mm. But the thing that Cole did to antagonize the Underworld is not kill the Charmed Ones. So this might be an instance where the enemy of my enemy is my friend does not apply. Hmm, hmm. Also, little thing, I should probably save it for later, but I think it's really interesting that Cole is not a power of three vanquish. Yeah, well, I mean, that goes to what you said before about Balthazar not being that powerful a demon and yet him taking out the triad. There's a thing in science fiction and fantasy stories a lot where when we have to establish what makes humans different from other aliens and we have to, like, point to what is our human thing that makes us special or even the humans in D&D the thing that makes humans different is that we can grow and change Hmm. in a lot of sci-fi and fantasy stories that's why in that episode of Star Trek Q wants to add Riker to the Q continuum so that he can have that aspect of humanity a lot of times in science fiction humans have an imagination that is different fundamentally from you know, what aliens do. And so I like that Balthazar is just a low-level demon. He's not a big deal. But because he's half-human, because he's mixed with Cole, 
he has the ability to grow and become the strongest demon, the source of all evil. The thing is, I don't think he's a low-level demon. Like, the Book of Shadows talks about him as a serious threat, and everyone does deal with Balthazar as a serious threat. But I think it is more that, like what you said, him being half-human allows him to grow beyond, uh, although I think it might be more of a, you know, wicked, Alphaba's more powerful because she's the children of two worlds sort of thing. Yeah. Or like how um, mixed breeds of dogs are healthier than purebred dogs. Well, yeah, but that's just because humans have done terrible, terrible things to wolves. Yes, but... Or, or Spock, because Spock is half-human and that, that gives him a kind of edge over other Vulcans. Did not work out for, uh, Counselor Troy, though. Yeah, she just is, she's just beta Z but weaker. Yeah. Poor Troy. But this is a thing where him being part of two different worlds allows him to become stronger. And I do like the idea that, not necessarily that he's lower level, but possibly that everyone is underestimating him. And he does have vulnerabilities other demons do not. He doesn't require a power of three spell to vanquish. Mm-hmm. But as we've seen, he's a force to be reckoned with. A force to be reckoned with. So uh, speaking of, well, he has this gaping gut wound. He basically collapses part of the mausoleum onto the guy chasing him. Yeah, yeah, he manages to get away even as he can barely keep himself in his demon form. He keeps flickering back to Cole and, and Balthazar. And then, in his Cole form, it's the strength of his human form, he escapes by blending in with the crowd. Yeah, he a- he asks a mourner if he can catch a ride to the rest of the funeral with her, and she's like, Of course you can, I know. I know it's a rough time for all of us. And I'm like, you don't have questions about this weird sweaty guy who just showed up in the middle of the funeral? I mean, maybe he just looks upset. And and the, I don't know, he's he's a good looking guy. It's a few, he, he's like, but he's a good looking guy and like he looks professional. Oh, not like, well, I guess I'm single now, so... No, no, I meant, you know, he's 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 a professional, clean-cut guy. I mean, not so clean-cut now, but... Yeah, but he's still wearing a... He, you can't tell that he's bleeding because he has a trench coat over it. Mm. But uh, that makes sense to me that he would have gone to the funeral itself with a person who, for whatever reason, has left, and now he wants a ride to the wake from the from the graveside. That's, that's, that tracks for me. Okay, I haven't been super paying attention, but Julian McMahon is in the opening credits in this yes. episode. Yes, yes. He was added a few episodes ago. Mm. So, uh, yes, Cole escapes, and the demon, you know, shakes his fist at the departing limo. The demon who will be after him for the rest of this episode. Yes. I'd have to imagine... I mean, I guess it makes sense that the source is sending people after Cole for killing the triad... Because the triad were, like, his dudes. But I'd imagine he'd be upset with the triad because they kept failing to kill the charmed ones, right? Yeah, but what's he going to do? They're already dead. And, and I'm Cole... just saying Cole did him a favor, right? No, Cole has shown himself to be a serious threat. Mm-hmm. Actually, we kind of see that later when... I... It becomes confusing because later Cole does become the source. But Cole actually holds his own against the source in a fight as a demon. Mm -hmm. Which probably showed the source that, hey, I can probably body hop over to this guy after my current form is destroyed. Yeah. So maybe not the best thing to show the source of all evil, an entity that likes to jump bodies. Hey, this might be a good body to jump into. But I digress. (laughs) Back at Hallowell Manor, Phoebe and Prue are discussing how they're going to find Balthazar since the spell apparently didn't work. And they rewrote the spell they used for, to find Melinda Warren. Mm. And Prue says, yeah, it's the same principle. It's magic calling magic. Except this time it's good magic calling evil magic. And Phoebe's like, okay, but can you do this without me? Because I really want to go to Cole's office and see if I can find him. Because he's been missing for a few days. And so it has been a few days since Piper stabbed Cole. Yes. Yes. Because, because Cole... Broke the sisters up using the emotion-manipulating demon, 
and then got possessed by the emotion manipulating demon after uh, telling Phoebe to go make up with her sisters. I think it's only been one day, though, because Prue mentions that she knows that Phoebe's been running around town looking for Cole because she got a parking ticket the day before at his office. Hmm. So I think that, you know, it was one day without Cole. So one or two days, probably. One day without Cole, went looking for him, got a parking ticket. Now it's the day after that. Then uh, Phoebe is acting kind of weird then. I mean, Cole is a squirrely guy who obviously has secrets and then he just vanishes? I don't know. It's, I, th- I think it's okay for her to be concerned. Hmm. Also, it's another uh, incident of Phoebe doing something bad with Prue's car. Yeah, getting a parking ticket. I, I like that Phoebe's like, don't worry about it, I'll pay for the ticket. And Prue's like, that's not the point. The point is, Cole is obviously uh, not okay. Like, I'm not okay with this. It's bad. Also, I mean, I know it's not the point or whatever, but how is Phoebe going to pay for the parking ticket? She, she's in college. She's making negative money. I guess she could use her student loans. Maybe she's writing papers for people and charging them for it. Oh, wow. Those people are not getting their money's worth, I'm assuming. <laughs> not that Phoebe's not smart, but... Maybe she's writing people's poems for them for creative writing class. So she's sending spells out. In the... You have to be careful if you... She did that already in that one episode. Yeah, where the guys... Right, in that episode where she gave... Uh her classmates a poem that turned animals into human men so they could date them yup you think witches have to be careful about accidentally rhyming yes i do yes i do so prue's like look we can we can handle balthazar without you he doesn't require the power of three to vanquish and let's face it even with your active power it's not like you're going to be that useful you know with him here i mean i guess if we need a karate kick we'll phone you but why don't you go look for your missing boyfriend who i hate speaking of continuity though and i mean this is only continuity with last week but but prue does say hey remember last last week we said we would be honest with each other so i guess it has been at least a week she she didn't say week i said week she said remember when the triad tried to break us up we promised we'd be honest with each other i have to be honest Cole's crap. Don't date him. No, I feel like I feel like it has been a period of time, especially the way Cole talks to uh, Phoebe later in the episode when he tells uh, her about the emotion demon thing. I guess that makes sense. I was thinking that it couldn't have been a full week because Cole is still bleeding, but now we cut to Cole in an alley, and it's pretty clear that the wound is not healing. Mm. And, um... Good job, makeup department. That's disgusting. Yeah. So, the weird thing is, this episode, like most of the recent episodes, features a fair amount of cold beefcake. It is sort of counterbalanced by the massive wound in his stomach. With, like, just enough pus around the outside of it that you're like, ugh, but not so much that you think it looks fake. Hmm. And it's like congratulations, you've managed to make me not want Julian McMahon to take a shirt off. Good job, makeup people! Yeah, well, until we get him trying to bandage the wound, and they shoot him very conspicuously from the other side, where you can't see the wound, but you can see a very sweaty, very shirtless Julian McMahon. Yes. I I do, I, I love how he tries to, like, rip his shirt so that he can make a bandage, but he's not strong enough, so he shifts back into Balthazar, and then he really easily, uh, Rips, rips the, the shirt. shirt yeah it's interesting I, I talked a little bit about how his clothes don't change with him mm-hmm. or rather they they do change with him but they become completely different clothes right but i guess once he takes them off they become a separate object because cole wears suits and balthazar wears this like all black demon ensemble thing a demon ensemble yes You'd think that he'd be in his Balthazar form for most of this, since it gets established later this episode that being in his human form weakens him, which I, I, you know what, I gotta, I gotta assume it's bullshit. I gotta assume that the demon just doesn't know what he's talking about when he says that. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, they don't want to pay the actor who's not, you know. Right, right. They don't want to pay the stunt guy that they hired to be Balthazar. Yeah. So, like... 
Cole spends most of his time in his cult form. Yeah. Now, as you said, though, right now he's Balthazar. He changes into Balthazar so that he can bandage his wound, so he can rip up the shirt and bandage his wound. And a homeless guy comes around the corner while he is in his Balthazar form, and so he hightails it out of there, leaving behind his jacket. Mm. So that guy picks up Cole's jacket. And back in the Hallowell Manor, they are about to do the spell to call the magic to them. Um, Okay. Again, I know I I said this so much this episode already, but I love this setup they have. They flip over a table so that they can use it as, like, a shield against uh, against Balthazar when they call him. Uh Uh-huh. And then they just set up this little vanquishing area. They do the spell to call forth the Balthazar. And they throw the uh, the vanquishing potion, but uh oh, they didn't get the right demon. Whoopsie doodles. Yep, yep. It is it is the the bounty hunter demon, and he's so annoyed, especially because they throw the vanquishing potion on him, and he's like, ah, this jacket is dry clean only. I love the casual danger dialogue too. Like, the, the demon blasts a hole in the table, and Prue's like, that was an antique, which clearly it wasn't. Right? I, I, like, we just saw it get blasted. Was that an antique fiberboard table? <laughs> yes. Also, also, you're, you you set it up to use as a shield. Come on. Yeah. But Prue, like, flings the uh, demon away, and Piper freezes him in midair, and Prue's like, why, 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 why did you do that? And... Piper's like, the clock! That's a nice clock, and we've had to fix it so many times. And this is the kind of banter I really like. Yes. Also, you set up this area specifically for calling and vanquishing Balthazar, but you didn't move any of the nice objects that were around it out of the way. Well, the thing about having an ancestral home is that basically everything in it is an antique. Hmm. So, they realize, uh, Prue asks Piper if she can, and Piper's like, I don't know, let's give it a shot. Just unfreeze the demon's head. Just unfreeze his head so that they can interrogate him while he's frozen. And it turns out Piper can, in fact, do that. Again, I feel like this just feeds into your thing about Piper never actually getting a secondary power in the explosions. Right, yeah. Because her power, unlike, I guess, Prue's scaled up. You remember back when Andy was still alive, when they were fighting those uh, guys that stole sight? Mm -hmm. They made a big deal out of Prue's telekinesis getting stronger in that episode, and they Mm -hmm. started showing her move bigger objects. I mean, she just threw this demon. This is like a big guy. Yeah, but that's not really a new thing for her. I feel like they didn't follow up on that as much as Piper's power, I feel like, has had the more visible evolution throughout the show. Mm, Like, the the stuff she can do with it. She uh, can do it for longer. She can do it in larger areas or more specific areas like being able to freeze just one guy yeah yeah and she can like she can only freeze the uh, innocents in a room like we've oh yeah that was that was impressive like we've seen piper really flexing her power in a way we haven't really seen with the other two it's interesting that throughout the show piper is the person who is most against being a witch she's the person who is most feeling the pain of not getting to lead a quote-unquote normal life, life, right? But she's the one whose power is the most... Versatile? Yeah, but also she's the one whose power grows the most, and I think that's because she's the one who uses her power the most. Not that that's Phoebe's fault. She can't choose when to use her power. (laughs) She just walks around touching everything that looks ominous, trying to get a premonition. Unless this is the first half of season one, in which case she could... I'm sorry, I, I know we've talked this to death, but the fact that Phoebe's powers get worse and worse every season until she gets the empathy, which is very, very useful, but also just so irritating for the audience. I can't speak for everyone, but I found Phoebe's empathy power just beyond irritating. I'm sorry, I'm just imagining Phoebe walking around trying to get a, a read off of things. I guess that's what she did when she was in the auction house. Just walking around trying to get a vision off of things. Well, remember when she was working as a hotel psychic, she could just get premonitions whenever she wanted. She saw really specific stuff, too. I know, it's like everyone had something significant happening. She she got a premonition off of every person. Although, I mean, I guess that woman gaining weight at a Weight Watchers meeting isn't like... I would guess it was significant to her, but... And, like... In the episode of with Mark, the ghost, she could, like, hold on visions and, like, look mm-hmm. back on them. 
Like, those were cool things that, I I mean, I guess I kind of get why they didn't bring that back, because it's not, like, showy or anything. Well, I mean, they haven't gone back to that, but I assume, based on the episode with the ghost boyfriend, that she does have perfect recall of her of her premonitions. Mm. So, anyway, they interrogate this guy, and then Piper's like, bored now, and throws him into the clock. She's like, whatever. Yeah, he's not giving them useful information. He's being a dick, because, of course, demon... It's worth it to throw him into the clock. Leo can heal it. It got it got injured in the course of fighting evil, right? What what else is Leo there for? Yes. And once he gets thrown into the clock, he tells them that he is a bounty hunter, that he's after Cole, and that maybe they should team up and fight Cole together. Hmm. Oh, obviously though he doesn't say Cole, he says Balthazar. Yes. I just just never a good idea. Never a good idea. Yeah, don't team up with demons. So, um, unless unless it is Cole. Yes. Speaking of, Phoebe goes into Cole's office to try to find him, but instead <gasps> finds someone else sitting in his chair. Reese Davidson. This, is this part of that weird thing where uh, IA in cop shows is always evil, internal investigations? Um, I don't, no, I don't think I'm this sorry, is... I'm sorry, is that IA? It is, it is. That's not who this guy is, though. Um, he says that he is the from the DA Bureau of Investigations, which is not a thing I have ever heard of. I guess I could have Googled to see if it's a thing. Hmm. It's not a thing I've ever heard of, but essentially he, he's basically like District Attorney HR because Cole just up and disappeared. Well, Cole's also been a pretty suspicious guy. But I mean, I mean, mostly it's it's that he he disappeared, and he asks Phoebe if she knows what the deal is. He's like, "Hey, are you Cole's girl?" She's like, "I'm no one's girl, but yeah, I'm his girlfriend." I just you remember the thing that introduced us to Cole, the episode with the like guardian demons who protected serial killers, and oh yeah, and like he he blew up the judge and all of the demons in the courtroom, and then he had to pretend like. He got knocked unconscious, and he's like, what happened? Why is half the courtroom gone now? Well, also, also, when he asks Phoebe, like, did he say anything? Phoebe's like, yeah, he said he might have to leave town because of a big case he was working on. And this guy's like, he's not working on any cases right now, so that was a lie. And what kind of DA doesn't have any cases on his... uh... Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I... I mean, I, I assume that what's happening is he's using some sort of mental power, and whenever one of his superiors tries to give him a case, he, like, Jedi mind tricks him into not giving it to him, so that he has time to go around being a demon and having sex with Phoebe. I can see him being under investigation as soon as he's not in the office pushing brains around. <laughs> right. That's the nice thing about having a really, really ill-defined power set, is that you can just do stuff like that. Right. It's, I'm using my magnetic personality to convince you to do something, as Magneto once does in yeah, X-Men. Yeah, in the, in the Silver Age, Magneto had mind control powers because magnetic personality, and later because he could, like, change the way your blood flows so that you That makes more... sense, though, because there's iron in your blood, and iron is ferrous. I'm cool with that. Hmm. So, back at the manor, uh... Prue and Piper are trying to figure out whether or not they should work with the demon. Piper points out that they have attempted to work with demons in the past, and it has gone poorly. More continuity! Yeah. And... Uh, Which episode was that? The Horseman of the Apocalypse episode. Right. Although, I mean... They did stop the apocalypse. They did stop the apocalypse, and if it wasn't for them, you wouldn't have gotten Prue out of that weird blob dimension she was stuck in. But yes, no, it, it, it is generally a bad idea to work with demons. I do appreciate here that the bounty hunter demon is like, aren't you worried about all of this stuff that Balthazar has been up to? And they're like, we have no idea what you're talking about. And he's like, wow, your white lighter sucks. How, how does your white lighter not know all of the stuff that's going on? Yeah, and they're like... Which is a good point! Well, Leo's been busy with, you know, trying to get secret married to Piper and then having to negotiate a relationship with Piper with the elders. I mean, honestly, this is why they should probably put a different white lighter on. Just have Leo reassigned. He can still be with Piper. 
Mm-hmm. But no, they never do that. Leo's the only white lighter the Charmed Ones ever get until, I mean, he gets that, like, one episode replacement who dies. I don't even remember that. I think it's in the Wrestling with Demons episode. And then later, uh, Leo gets uh, replaced by Chris, who is... Right, of course. Oh. An even worse choice. Well, yeah. He can't heal. It's the one thing White Lighters are good for. We'll, we'll talk about that more when we talk about Chris, though. Yes. So, again, they're trying to have this guy sell them on why he, they should work with him. And he says, you know... I'm a bounty hunter, Balthazar's my bounty, right now I care a lot more about getting him than killing some witches. And again, I say, the reason he's being hunted is because he didn't kill the Charmed Ones. Don't team up with the bounty hunter. Well, one of the reasons they believe him, one of the reasons they're willing to trust him is because he's completely honest. He's like, Yeah, he is telling the truth. Yeah, and he, he tells them, like, look, if I didn't already have an assignment, yeah, I'd probably be trying to kill you right now. Like, I would like nothing more than to, you know, cut off your heads and deliver them to the source. But I can't do that until I get Balthazar. You also want Balthazar, who, guess what, also wants to cut off your heads and give them to the source because that's the only way he can get out of this situation. So if you work with me, then, you know, you have an ally for the time being. Which is not the most persuasive argument ever, but... Mm. Also, it really feels like he's not adding a lot to this team. Yeah. I really feel like they should just vanquish this guy and go about their day. Yeah. Because, like, is there... A, like, you know, his things like, oh, I can track Balthazar. I can sense whenever he uses his demonic powers. And it's like, I feel like they could probably whip something up. Is this a job for scrying? Well, they, they tried to scry. They weren't able to scry. Oh, right, because he's immune to it in his human form? Yeah, I think that's probably what it is. Oh, I bet that makes sense, like, as a name thing, because they're looking for Balthazar, and when he's coal, he's technically coal, so. Yeah. Yeah, you know what? I buy that. Names are important, right? Yes, names matter a lot, especially in magic. So Phoebe goes to Cole's apartment to try to find him, find out what's going on. And he's not there, but his neighbor is like... Oh, hey. His neighbor who is weirdly cosplaying as Phoebe? Okay, yeah, like, I didn't, I didn't see this until you pointed it out, but, yeah, his neighbor has, like, naturally dark hair with highlights the way Phoebe does, and she's wearing the kind of, like, silk shirt that you can imagine Phoebe wearing, and since she just sticks her head out for a second and then back in, it is a weird choice for the casting people to put her in there, someone Hmm. who looks so much like Phoebe. It's like, I can imagine there's this whole other plot that we never see where this woman has seen Phoebe going in and out of Cole's apartment and she's in love with Cole, so she started dressing up like Phoebe so that she could, like, seduce Cole. Like that bartender at uh, P3. Exactly. Yeah. So Phoebe notices that there was, you know, blood outside his door because apparently at some point he stopped by his apartment to, you know. Yeah. And also, remember he left blood on the gravestone. Maybe, Cole, when you're hiding, I know I know you're bleeding from a wound that won't heal, but maybe try to not bleed all over everything. So we get a series of very ominous, I love this, I love the shot composition here. We have this series of shots of Phoebe wandering through Cole's apartment looking for him. And we see Balthazar hiding behind a door. God, I just, the cinematography in this episode is so good. Yeah, this this is really well structured to create suspense, you know? It's so many tight shots as she's going around corners. It feels claustrophobic. You feel like you don't know what's coming next. Mm-hmm. So Phoebe goes and she opens the door and she sees Cole in his Cole form with his gut wound. And he looks real bad right now. He tells Phoebe, you shouldn't be here. And you know what? I am going to say it. We spent so much time talking about her power. She leaned down and touched that blood and did not get a premonition or a past monition. Like, I mean, Phoebe's powers towards Cole have been so off for their whole relationship. She's had one premonition about him, and it was about the time when he got attacked by a different demon. Phoebe's powers are like, no, no, we can't. Spoiler alert. 
I mean, it is the problem with introducing a character who has psychic powers. That is the issue, but... Yeah. So, Phoebe does not have a premonition. And also, she doesn't have a... Basic common sense? Yeah, he's he's missing a huge chunk where Piper cut a chunk out of Balthus... Whatever. She's like, oh no! Get into bed so that I can care for you! And he's like, no, it's too bad. You you can't handle this. And she's like, no, I'm, I've seen a lot of stabbed, bleeding, dying people. He's like, so lucky I know your deal. Phoebe's like, we have to get you to a hospital. And Cole's like, no, no hospitals. And he tells Phoebe that basically he's being hunted. He is being hunted and... Uh, that's why he can't go to a hospital. And Phoebe says someone was in his office looking for him. And I guess that makes sense because DA Bureau of Investigation is not a real thing. So that guy was probably just a different demon bounty hunter. So Cole is very quickly becoming also not the brightest bulb in the universe. He, uh, he's like, there was someone in my office. Are you sure he wasn't a demon, a DA? <laughs> right. <laughs> and Phoebe's like, what a perfectly natural slip of the tongue. Uh, he said that he worked for the DA's office. I... Uh, Phoebe's trying to call Leo so that he can come and heal Cole. And she, Cole's like, why could... Cole on the phone. No, she's just calling out to him. But, like, away from Cole. She, like, turns her back and she's like, Leo! And she tells Cole, I'm trying to get Leo. He can help you because he's a... White light, I mean, doctor. So, you know, they're just oh, made for each other. It's just... I mean, I think she's supposed to be a little suspicious here. But, I mean, there are so, 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 so many red flags, maybe. I mean... They're not even red flags. Red flags are not obvious enough. She's less suspicious than she should be, considering that the amount of suspicious she should be is realizing what's happening. He literally said demon and then walked it back. Like, I know there's a willing suspension of disbelief for this sort of thing, but holy crap, Phoebe. Also, as I said, he's wounded in the same place you wounded Balthazar. And hey, as you pointed out, remember that thing where he got trapped in Prue's demon trap? Like... Not looking good for Cole is what I'm saying. No. No. So, Phoebe's going to go back to the house and get her friend Leo. You've met Leo. He's a doctor. And Cole's like, wait, I thought he was, like, this unemployed guy who worked at Piper's bar. He doesn't work there. He just lives there. <laughs> but, yes, Leo is, like, the best doctor ever, and he will fix Cole. Cole doesn't have to go to a hospital. Phoebe knows a guy. She lived in New York. <laughs> so then she kisses Cole, and the way Cole looks at her, you can tell that he is actually in love with her, and he should be not letting himself be distracted because Leo is a white lighter and is totally going to blow up his situation, but also he's dying, so there's not a lot he can do. Yeah. Again, tons of Cole beefcake in this episode. We see his hairy, heaving chest as he, you know tries to keep Balthazar in, and it's very, very, uh... I feel like they knew what audience they were going <laughs> for at this point. Ah, uh, yes. Ah, uh, yes. I, I I, am the person who is being catered to, who is being serviced by this fan service, and I appreciate it. Yes. So, back at the manor, <laughs> Piper's like, Leo, how did you not know who the triad were or that they had just been killed? Why... Why are you the way that you are? And Leo's like, I've been busy with other stuff. And besides, it just happened recentishly. Oh, anyway, Prue's like, we should work with this bounty hunter. He was straight with us. And Piper's like, yeah, he straight up told us that he would <laughs> kill us if he had the chance. So. And Prue's like, look, if there are two demons trying to kill us, I would rather have one of them kill the other one before, you know, we have to fight them both. I mean, that's fair. Yeah. And she's like, and look, if he's fighting by our sides, we don't have to constantly be looking over our shoulders, which I guess... 
there's been, and you know what, this is this is appropriate because I have felt for a long time like Prue's reaction to Balthazar is outsized. Like she's way more upset about Balthazar than like, concerned about him, scared of him than she should be. Yes, which so they 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 summon back the bounty hunter just as Phoebe walks through the door, and I know I've said this so many times, I. I know I've said that I love things so many times, but I love how Phoebe just fucking goes. Like, she's like, demon! And then she, like, does this double kick and knocks him back, and she's like, vanquish him! Vanquish him now! And they're like, oh, Phoebe, you missed a lot while you were gone. But I I feel like a lot of this episode and the way the sisters handle demon fighting shows kind of how naturally they've settled into these roles. Mm -hmm. Like... They're not the, you know, they're not the girls we had at the beginning of the series who ran away from Jeremy and, yeah. you know, needed to cloister themselves in the attic. Like, even Phoebe, who, despite having an active power, like, like she just takes the situation in hand. I love how competent they are, which sounds like, again, a weird thing to say, but competent, proactive, and I like that the show is showing that they have become very good at this. Yeah. Yeah. So, they're going to go. They're going to fight with this demon. They have the potion that vanquishes him. And his deal, by the way, is that he can smell evil. So he can, like, he's basically like a like a hound dog. He can, like, scent Balthazar. Mm. And he tells us that the reason Balthazar was hiding in the graveyard in the first place is because... It's hard to smell evil because there's so much evil in cemeteries, which is like, oh, what a weird fear of death you have. But okay. Mm. Yeah, you'd think it would be like a consecrated ground thing, but no. Right? And we know death isn't evil because they have one of those really irritating... Actually, I think they have like four of those really irritating, oh, no, death is a necessary thing episodes later. Yeah. Jack, Jack, get in my sack. Yeah. Yeah. I'm pretty sure like... Piper becomes the incarnation of death. and Prue does. No, I mean later Piper does. Ah, yes. Because they basically recycle the plot after <laughs> they do it with Prue. But... So while, the, while Prue and Piper are hunting down Balthazar, Phoebe brings Leo to Cole's apartment, which is great because everybody's like running around looking for Balthazar, and Phoebe brings Leo to Cole's apartment. Really significantly, when they finished, we kind of skipped over it, when they finished making the vanquishing potion at the beginning of the episode, they gave Phoebe a vial of it, which she has had all episode. Phoebe has the means to vanquish Balthazar. Yes. With her. Yes. And she... It's interesting how they keep taking... how the other two sisters are comfortable taking her out of play for the showdown with Bel- with Balthazar. I guess it makes sense considering how freaked out Prue's been by this one particular demon. Do you think subconsciously they suspect that Cole might be Balthazar, so they think it's better to not have Phoebe with them? Well, in that case, they... Subconsciously. Maybe. I mean, she is expressly looking for and or dealing with a Cole situation, so subconsciously then they should probably not want her alone with Cole. Yeah, that's true. So, Phoebe and Leo are at Cole's apartment now, and Leo is trying to heal Cole, which, by the way, it should be a tip-off that Cole doesn't have more questions, but I guess he's also pretty near death. Oh, yeah, he's, like, in and out. And Leo brings up to Phoebe, he's like, you know, I can't just heal whatever I want. I can only heal things that were, you know injured in the course of fighting evil and phoebe's like okay look you say that a lot but i've personally seen you heal shit that had nothing to do with the fight against evil multiple times so i know you can just heal my boyfriend and i was like okay okay she's like yeah tell the elders that i will stop being a charmed one if my boyfriend dies which i don't I don't think it's like a cleric thing where he need. I mean, I mean, I know he said that he needs permission from the elders, but I think it's more he gets in trouble if he heals stuff he's not supposed to. Well, now there is. It, it's not like a D and D thing where you need to ask your god for healing spells if you're a cleric. Right, but there are some things that he can't heal because he's like, I can only half heal him for some reason. For some reason, only half of him is susceptible to my ability to heal humans. Hmm. Weird. Weird that. 
Also, he gets blasted across the room while trying to heal Cole. So Cole wakes up and he's like, wow, you're one hell of a doctor. And Leo's like, so Phoebe, can I talk to you in the other room? (laughs) Don't worry, Cole, it's not about you. (laughs) And then Phoebe leaves and he's like, I need to talk to you about Cole. Yeah, Phoebe, uh, Phoebe gives Cole a little peck on the cheek. Phoebe is dressed very pink this episode, by the way. She is. She kind of looks like she's casual cosplaying Daphne. I was wondering if she was wearing a lot of pink because it's a youthful color and they wanted to emphasize her innocence when contrasted with her dating a demon. Mm. So Leo's like, look, I had trouble healing Cole, which means there's definitely something up with him because, you know... I should be able to heal whatever, but I only half healed him. And, and Phoebe's like, maybe it's because he was weak. And Leo's like, what? That doesn't make any sense. No, that's the stupidest. Thing. Remember when I, remember when I brought Piper back from, you know, the place between life and death, I'm totally capable of healing people who are at the brink of death. No, something else is up here. I do appreciate that Leo, as, as much as I was ragging on him earlier in the episode is like, okay, he's obviously part demon. Also, his terrible wound that wouldn't heal is in the same place where Piper wounded Balthazar. Do I need to draw you a picture, Phoebe? He doesn't bring this up. And I I don't think it was intentional. And this is something I don't think the show ever follows up on. But there have to be a bunch of half-demon people out there who just don't know they're part demon. Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, yeah, that has to be, like, a thing. Which I wish the show had done something more with. I wish that, honestly, I wish they had done more with Cole being half human. I mean, I think we can just, it, we can, it's just a given that we want there to have been more Cole. Yeah. Just more Cole. But, I mean, it is an interesting idea that there are people out there that Leo couldn't heal all the way. And it's just because they have demon ancestry. Mm Mm-hmm. So Phoebe sends Leo away. She's like, I'll deal with this. And then she goes to have the talk with Cole. Yes, she is going to ask him the hard questions. It's funny. Usually the hard questions are where is this relationship going? I guess that is still the question. It's just the answer now is to hell. Mm. We could really raise the beam and make marriage a hell. <laughs> yes. Oh, anyway. So Prue and Piper follow the bounty hunter God, like Brax? No. Something. He has a, you know, very... Zo- oh, I... Yeah, I forget what his name is. Zoltar. The Zol- bounty hunter. Yeah. They follow the bounty hunter into an alley because he can smell Cole's blood, but it turns out it's just the homeless guy who took Cole's jacket earlier. And and Prue's like, yeah, that's not him. That's just the guy who took his jacket. Prue and- has a weird classism thing where she's like... That's not him. That's some nobody. That's some trash person. No offense. And the homeless guy's like, yeah, thanks, lady. Well, and then, and then the demon bounty hunter is like, no, it's definitely him. And he grabs the potion from Prue and throws it at the guy and nothing happens because it's not him. Then he starts, like, electrocuting the guy and Prue's like, eh, stop it. Stop. Stop it. And he drops the guy and the guy's like, thanks, lady. And he runs off. But... She she drops into a crouch and does a spinning, like, sweep the leg thing, which is definitely Phoebe's ballywick. And between being the sister who's supposedly into all of the magical research and now being the sister who knows kickboxing, Prue is just, like, stealing all of Phoebe's stuff. Yeah, a lot of the, I guess this is later Prue, a lot of the season three Prue stuff is her using her telekinesis to help her kung fu fight again the show is turning into very much turning into their we want to be buffy Mm -hmm. i feel like that's probably the strongest in season three it starts going away when it just becomes the fetish show later yeah i mean it's the strong it's the strongest in season three when phoebe dyes her hair blonde and starts having sex with a demon Mm. (laughs) so a demon with a soul right exactly so 
the guy, the homeless guy leaves the jacket behind, and Prue's like, oh, fuck, this is Cole's jacket. And also, Cole is obviously Balthazar. And also, we've never seen Cole and Balthazar in the same room, and Balthazar started hunting us right around the time Cole showed up, and also he has a wound right where the wound is, and also, like, it's just so super obvious. Hey, remember when you got caught in my demon trap that one time? Right, and he got caught in the <laughs> demon trap, so... Yeah, so at this point, basically, everybody is, uh is plugged in that Cole is Balthazar. Cole is Balthazar? Ben is glory? (laughs) But yes, we have a very tension-filled scene where Phoebe's, like, trying to get Cole to admit that he's Balthazar. Meanwhile, he's trying to get Phoebe to admit that she's one of the charmed ones. He's like, wow, so Leo sure did do a great job healing me. And the weird thing is, I know I was kind of in and out of it, but I don't remember him doing any, like, medicine stuff. What's the deal with that? And Phoebe's like, he's really good at what he does. Are you really good at what you do? What do you do when you're not being a district attorney? And what was that family drama you told me about? Well, and what's this case that you're working on? And also she's going through his drawers and they are all completely empty, which is like that biggest red flag. Who has completely empty drawers? Like desk drawers. Mm. Um, she does find a pencil, which when he's like, are you going through my drawers? What you're looking for? And she's like, a pencil. I just wanted to write down stuff about our relationship for later. She's like, I just wanted to make a note. <laughs> and he's like, there's a pad of paper right there. So she picks up the pad of paper. And Cole has changed now that he has been healed into the Balthazar black turtleneck. I like that he changed twice because we first see him and he's pulling on a... Uh, a tank top and then we see him again and he's pulling on so he's wearing a tank top and then a black turtleneck over a tank top that is weird i i think the tank top is like an undershirt like he was gonna put on a dress shirt Mm. so okay i love this leo is like leo goes to the bounty hunter and piper and Prue. he's like wait i've got news for you piper i know you were upset that i wasn't telling you things because i didn't know things but i know something now and she's like you know that cole's balthazar and he's like god damn it (laughs) I was doing a good job for once. And Piper even kind of snaps at him. She's like, you just wait here. We will fix this. Which, I mean, that is that is your job. Yes. It's just, it's great because the bounty hunter's like, we don't have to bring him with us, you know, when we go kill Balthazar. Do we? And Prue's like, God, no. And they walk off and, you know, Leo's doing his sad Charlie Brown walk. <laughs> so now we get a different tense scene with Phoebe and Cole because they're having a conversation and we see in Phoebe's hand as you mentioned she's holding on to the potion she's deciding the what very she's going to do with it the very pink potion yeah do you think that Phoebe's pink in this episode is meant to be tied to the pink potion because in the end it's actually Phoebe who's Cole's downfall not the vanquishing potion twas beauty killed the beast I feel like you're teasing me, but I mean, seriously. No, I mean, no, seriously. I was agreeing with you. Twas beauty killed the beast. Especially with the rest of their relationship, but... Yeah. yeah. So, this tense scene is interrupted by everybody else storming in and being like, Hey! You're Balthazar! Stop! And Cole turns into Balthazar, grabs Phoebe and a knife. The bounty hunter shoots some lightning, but Prue's like, No! And deflects it. Because, right, she she doesn't want Phoebe to get hit. Yeah, and then Cole shimmers away with uh, Phoebe. Yep. Hmm. Hmm? They can track him through his teleports. That's the thing. We find out... uh, Yeah, the bounty hunter has mentioned he can smell evil and he can track his magic. That's going to be a thing for uh, Cole's storyline for most of the rest of Season 3 is him being hunted by bounty hunters. And that is one of the reliable things that... You know, they can sense when he teleports. I mean, I don't think he had a lot of choice here. Oh, no, no. But I I do like that they can sense when he uses his magic. And that's why he's been struggling to stay in his coal form, because because the bounty hunter can... Oh, I guess that's why he's been staying in his coal form, because the bounty hunter can track his magical signature, you know, as (laughs) Balthazar. Because I guess you give off low ambient magic when you're in a full demon form i mean that makes sense so now the bounty hunter is just mocking the sisters for not letting him kill phoebe which is like yeah they're the charmed ones if if phoebe dies they stop being the charm well i mean hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
He's also like, oh my god, Cole fell in love with her. That's so gross. Oh, she's a human with like hum. Oh, gross. And he explains to the sisters that uh, Cole's more susceptible to this sort of thing because he is half human. Because the sisters would obviously not let any full demons near them. They're too smart for that. So they needed someone who understood human nuance. Mm -hmm. So they needed a half demon, half human. Which, I'm sorry, have you not met the Charmed Ones? Remember, Phoebe went out on a date with Jovna! Right? Although, I guess he was technically, uh... I guess he was technically a warlock, as was, uh, what's his bucket? Um, Jeremy. Jeremy, yeah. No, I think Jovna was a... Jovna was... was he? Oh, yeah, because that was when everything was a warlock, and we didn't really have demons yet. Yeah. So, as you said, the bounty hunter can follow Cole's... Balthazar's shimmer. So, he has crew hand over the potion, another potion that she has, and he's gonna go kill Cole, and she's like, okay, but if you hurt Phoebe, then I'm gonna be super mad, and I'm like, that's not a threat that's gonna work. Yeah, the way he gets them to hand it over is, he's like, look, your sister's probably dead by now, but on the off chance that she's not, your own, literally your only chance is giving me the potion that kills Balthazar and letting me teleport to where he is right now. I feel like they made a miscalculation here. Mm. I, I think that it puts Phoebe in a lot more danger to let this demon go after them than she's in with Cole slash Balthazar alone. Yeah, because, again... Cole's in love with her. Yeah, Cole's in love with her. This guy very much isn't. And also, two demons versus one demon. Also, there's nothing to stop him from vanquishing Balthazar and then killing Phoebe, who will be in a surprised and weakened state. Also, Phoebe specifically has a potion with which to vanquish Balthazar. Right? Also, like, Prue seems to think that threatening this demon and being like, hey, if you hurt Phoebe, I'll track you down, is going to mean anything. He's clearly demonstrated that he's not afraid of you. Yeah, also, it's your job as the Charmed Ones to kill him anyway. Right? So... Yeah, how is that different from his normal life day to day? Mm. God, if I was a demon, I would just not go to San Francisco. I feel like we don't get a lot of demons in San Francisco other than ones who are specifically trying to kill the Charmed Ones. Mm. It's not like Sunnydale where the Hellmouth draws vampires in, so they all go there even though Buffy's there waiting to stake them. Yeah, I guess that's kind of what they were trying to do with the Nexus, but the Nexus only ever really gets, I mean... Kind of the source is the only one who ever really cares about the Nexus, which God knows why. It's like one of the things he's weak to. I guess that would explain why he wants control of it. Yeah. But also, like, the Nexus is a stationary location, dude. If there's something that can kill you, but you can just not go to where it is. Yeah, that's not really a weakness. It's like, I'm I'm weak to, to massive ocean depths. Yeah. <laughs> you don't try to drain the ocean. <laughs> Uh, so you, you don't go into the ocean depths with like a bucket to try to scoop them out. Cole and Phoebe are in the cemetery and they're having a talk and Phoebe is sad because, you know, she she fell in love with Cole, but Cole's a demon. And Cole admits everything that he's done because he feels like she can't make a good fully informed choice unless she knows all of the things he's responsible for. Which, on one hand, I get. On one hand, you know, it's good that you don't want any of this to come up and be used against you later. On the other hand, you're kind of giving her a ton of reasons to just throw that potion at you. He's like, Phoebe, I don't want our relationship to be based on a lie, so I want you to know that I did go back in time and try to kill the progenitor of your line. Also, I, uh, I hired that demon who tried to get you and your sisters to kill each other. And, uh... A few, there's been a few other things. I wasn't, I wasn't the French, the French Stuart genie wasn't me though. That was just the triad. <laughs> anyway, he's all like, but you made me love, you made me love you. And he tells her, he's like, look, I understand if you can't trust me. I understand if you've, yeah, I understand if you need to kill me. Like if you need to kill me, kill me. I just want you to know that I love you. And she's like, you're making this really difficult, but, you know, I'm going to kill you. 
but keep talking. But I'm going to kill you. But seriously, please just keep talking a little bit longer. She says she wants to believe in him. And then the bounty hunter shows up and is watching all of this from the shadows. And he's like, oh, gross. Gross, gross, gross. <laughs> I do love that Cole, like, spreads his arms out. And he's like, vanquish me. And the demon bounty hunter's like, okay. And he shoots lightning. And uh, Phoebe's like, no, even though I was going to kill you, no. And she pushes Cole out of the way. Well, it clarifies for her the way she feels. When he when he almost dies, she's like, oh, wait, I do love you. Okay, god damn it. <laughs> I'm the only one who gets to kill Cole. I mean. Mm. Mm. So Phoebe smuggles Cole because Cole is healed. He was healed by Leo, but he's not at full power yet. Yeah, she drags him into a He mos- was only half healed because he's only half human. Yeah! You said that like it's a joke. That's totally what the show said. Yeah. She drags him into the mausoleum. It's one of those convenient things in urban fantasy shows like Charmed and Buffy that all cemeteries have mausoleums that are somehow open and easy to get into. I mean, I, I get it more in Buffy because vampires break in there to, you know, to live oh, there, that's... so they probably don't relock them. That's fair. Although... God knows Spike probably should have after the, like, 500th time someone just broke into his crypt. I mean, maybe he just didn't worry about it because he knew that there was no point. Yeah, I mean, I guess there is no point in locking a door if you know whatever's after you can just break the lock and come in. So, Phoebe and Cole team up to kill the bounty hunter. Yeah, so she's fighting the bounty hunter with her kickboxing power. Mm. And... At one point, he gets her flat-footed, and he's about to he's about to kill her. And even though Prue said not to, and Cole's like, no! And he shoots lightning at the guy, and the guy explodes. And then Phoebe and Cole have a passionate kiss. How much do regular demons suck? Cole's still pretty injured at this point. I mean, I guess he took out the triad, who were very high-level guys while injured, but, mm-hmm. like, honestly, it feels like Cole probably could have taken care of this guy by himself at any point i guess he just needed the shot well also he needed to be half healed yes so phoebe takes his his jacket his overcoat his his sports coat and uh puts some of his blood on it and is like okay now you take off and i'm gonna tell everyone i vanquished you even even my sisters who i totally promised last week to not lie to anymore yes Cole, uh, Cole tells her, like, I need to go. We, like, this guy's gone, but demons are still going to be after me. Your sisters are still going to be after me. I love you, but we don't have a future. And Phoebe's like, you can have a future, though, if everyone thinks you're dead. The thing is... Phoebe helps Cole fake his vanquish. The thing about this is, this has so much more fallout than Phoebe becoming the Queen of Hell does. This is sort of the most dramatic thing that ever happens in Charmed. This is weirdly the biggest betrayal, which it wouldn't be weird if Phoebe didn't become the Queen of Hell later in the show. But this moment is sort of the darkest moment Phoebe gets, where she prioritizes Cole over her sisters. Hmm. Yeah. And it's really good. I... 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 Yeah, you're right, because this is, this, as you said, the biggest betrayal, and yet I am with Phoebe. Like, she can't tell them. If she tells them, other demons are going to find out. Like, this is, this is I mean, the only she, way. If she tells them, Prue's going to try to kill Cole again. Like, Cole, Prue is not going to let this go. Yeah. And, God, I just, the scene is treated with gravitas. That's the thing. A lot of, a lot of the times, Charmed doesn't really have weight, Bad things will happen, love interests will die, people will be phased out of the show, and it doesn't have an impact. But this really does, even though Cole is not dead and is very much not out of the action. Yep, not at all. Plus, again, Phoebe prioritizing a man over her sisters when her arc up to this point has been rejoining. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, it's just num 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 delicious melodrama. (laughs) So, back at the manor, Phoebe is upset. She's in her grief kimono. And she's she's holding the knife that Cole threatened her with the way that you hold an old lover's photograph. She's like, oh, I remember when he threatened me with this knife. 
and Prue tells her, you didn't do anything wrong. And Phoebe's like, I did. He loved me and I killed him. That's wrong, even if he was a demon. Yeah, and they, they think that she's upset because she was fooled. And she's not. She's upset because she... Is lying to them. Yeah. Well, and she says she's upset because she feels, at, on some level, like she betrayed Balthazar, so she says. But really, it's that she betrayed them. And Prue tells her, like, it's okay. The important thing is that it's over now. And, and then we get, like, this beautiful zoom-out shot of her lying on the couch, and you know that everything is not okay. Yeah, she she tells them that she needs time, and Prue and Piper leave her, and there's just this slow zoom. They, it's exactly what you said about them giving this moment weight and gravitas. Yeah, so this episode was really firing on all cylinders. I... I feel like this might not be one of the better episodes of our podcast because this was just a really good episode and it's hard to talk about those. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I enjoyed this episode. I, and I, it's, I feel about this episode, I think, the way you feel about All Hallows' Eve. Not my favorite, but definitely a top tier. Hmm. So I think we have some segments. Uh, I believe that we do. We have our own personal power of three. Let's tap into that power. Uh, the first power in our pack is Premonition. Who in this episode is, was, or will become famous later? Do you have anyone? I don't have anything for this. I actually do, and it's really weird. I I looked up the guy who's, like, the from the DA's office. Oh, yeah, he he did look kind of familiar. Yeah, I thought he looked familiar. Turns out I was wrong. He was not one of the four different actors I thought he might be. But he was the voice of Agent J in the Men in Black animated series, which is... I haven't seen it since I was a little kid, so maybe it doesn't hold up. But I remember it being, like, really, really good. That's so random. I also remember being kind of honked off that the uh, none of the movies really followed up on it. Because they established, like, this really cool, you know, mythology arc. And there was all this character work and stuff. And all these really cool alien designs. And then they made the second movie, and it was just the first movie all over again. That's funny, that's kind of like the real Ghostbusters, which is amazing and has its own mythology and had J. Michael Straczynski working on it, and yeah. Although, and, although I and will... And then the second movie was just the first movie all over again. Okay, the thing is, I will stick up for the second Ghostbusters movie. Ugh. I had to stop being a concert pianist to focus on my real passion, restoring paintings. Well, she got pregnant. She had to, like, do a job that they had more normal hours. Mm. I'm kind of honked off that Dana wasn't a part of the cartoon. Yeah, I mean, I guess they figured they couldn't... Uh... Have more than one woman? Mm. I was going to say they couldn't have a love interest for Bill Murray and have him stay that character. Did Vankman stay that character? I never really watched the real Ghostbusters. Yeah, Vankman stayed that character. Even when he became Dave Coulier? Especially when he get, became Dave Coulier. Remember, Dave Coulier got a blowjob from Alanis Morissette in a theater. He's Finkman wasn't the one that got a blowjob from a ghost. No, Dave Coulier did. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, but like the womanizer thing. Like, you don't oh, think oh, of Dave yeah. Coulier as being a womanizer, but man, he pissed off Alanis Morissette. Yeah, she's so good in the Great North when she has that little speech about, you know, someone whose name I won't mention. <laughs> oh. She's she's really good in the Great North. I wish she was in more episodes. I love Alanis Morissette, and I don't care for Dave Coulier, so I, I, I feel bad that she got so hurt by him, because it's like, he is not worth it. He... <laughs> There is no emotional response you should have to Dave Coulier other than vague annoyance. <laughs> exactly. Uh, uh, I mean, I I worked up when we watched a bunch of Full House for WandaVision because we foolishly thought that would be the show that they used for... Oh, don't get me started on that. But yes, we unfortunately watched a lot of Full House and it did instill a deep, deep hatred of uh, Uncle Joey in me because he's just the worst all the time. Well, I'm writing my Full House fan fiction and... I thought when I started writing it that 
Danny would be the main character, but Joey has turned into the main character, specifically because I hate Dave Coulier so much, so I kind of felt like I needed to rehab his character. Well, there's no re- I'm sorry that your wife died. Let me come live in your house, eat your food for free, and spit on your children. Like... Well, sorry, in my fan fiction, uh... He's obviously their bio dad. No, he is not their bio dad. He is Danny's ex-boyfriend who... Danny left when he got a what's-her-bucket pregnant. When he got pregnant. Pam pregnant, exactly. Exactly. I mean, it would make more sense if he was the girl's dad. Pam was Greek, and all of those girls are blonde. I know Pam's also blonde when we see But Danny has dark hair. Danny Tanner, brown of hair. <gasps> Joey Gladstone, gold of hair. Uh, I mean, Punnett Squares are more complicated than, than that, but... Yes. Yeah, but... Yeah. I guess uh, Jesse and Rebecca also had blonde children who grew up to be blonde adults, despite them both being brunettes. Okay, conspiracy theory. The Katsopolises are not actually Greek. They're pretending to be Greek, and as part of the ruse, they dye their hair black. That's why Pam is blonde! Mm, and that's why Jesse had a different uh, last name in the first season. Oh okay. my god, we're so far <laughs> off track. We were talking about the... Go- the I was going to say this isn't Welcome to San Francisco, but it is! It is. But, yes, uh, the guy who I believe will be in some other episodes, the guy from the district attorney's office, is Agent J in uh, the Men in Black animated series. So that means he could probably do a pretty decent Will Smith impression. Although, I, I don't remember the I show like he might not have. I cartoons they don't try to, to do the voices. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I don't think Lorenzo Music tried that hard to sound like Bill Murray, and Dave Coulier definitely did not. And the real Ghostbusters famously didn't have the likeness rights, so none of the guys look like the guys from Ghostbusters. Yeah. Hmm. I'm sorry, I believe that will bring us to our second segment, Time Freeze. What specifically dated this episode? This is such a minor thing. Do, do you have anything for it? No, no, tell me, what's your minor thing? Cole having a phone pad? Oh, yeah. He has a notepad next to the phone to take down messages. Which, I mean, I know that's, you know, not, it has literally no impact on the plot. It's just almost like, oh, yeah, that, that was a thing you used to have to do. I mean, I guess my time freeze is the fact that Phoebe's running all over looking for Cole because... She can't blow up his phone. She can't blow up his phone. Yeah, but other than that, there wasn't any really time-specific things in yeah, this, this episode. Yeah, this is a pretty timeless episode. All right, that brings us to our final segment, telekinesis. What, if anything, genuinely moved you? I mean, it was that last scene with Phoebe and Cole, right? Yeah, it's the last scene with Phoebe and Cole. I, I, here's the thing. Every time there was a scene between Phoebe and Cole in this episode, I thought, oh, this is going to be my telekinesis. And then the next time there was a scene with them, I was like, oh, wait, no, never mind. This is going to be my telekinesis. It's like every scene just built and built and built until the very end. So, yeah. The last Phoebe and Cole scene with an honorable mention for every other Phoebe and Cole scene in this episode. Yeah, again, this episode was fought, was firing on all cylinders. I was emotionally connected to Phoebe and Cole for all of their stuff, and... We're moving out of the point where Phoebe is one of the best characters in the show. Early on, she was kind of one of the best characters in the show. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm, and in my heart, I am always a Piper man. Piper is my consistent favorite throughout the show. But Phoebe was a really cool character in the beginning, and we are starting to move out of that. But we're at a really good point with her and Cole here, especially for their relationship. They, their relationship is... I mean, it becomes the driving force behind the show for a while, and it's understandable why. So, uh, next... Uh, Also, I do kind of have one of our secret powers, because over time our powers evolved, and I have a levitation. I feel like our levitation kind of overlaps a lot with telekinesis. It's what's a fuck yeah moment in the episode for you? It's a moment that lifts you up. Yeah. Which is... Like telekinesis, but not exactly. And mine are the fight scenes between the sisters and the bounty hunter. Yeah, they are all really well choreographed. There's a lot of good fight choreography in this episode. Yeah, and like I said when we were talking about them, you can really tell how much the sisters have grown into their demon fighting. Mm -hmm. Like, the sort of casual way they handle the bounty hunter shows you that 
they're really good at what they do now. Well, also the fact that they all apparently have kickboxing ability now does also speak to what you were saying about this show really, really wanting to uh, eat Buffy's lunch. Yes, except Holly Marie Combs. I mean, she has some fighting skills. Again, we saw that in the season opener. But I feel like they lean into that way less than with the other two. Holly Marie Combs has too much respect for the fact that this is a show about witches. Yes. Holly Marie Combs is like, you are not doing wire work with me. She's a witch purist. She's like, I am not a slayer. I am a witch. I'm going to stand in the middle of the room and I'm going to point at things. Exactly. So uh, after after this heavy coal episode... The next episode we're going to talk about is called Coyote Piper. Oh no, I remember this one. A demon possesses Piper on the night of her 10-year high school reunion. Oof, oof. This is, that's, a, that, that, that's a plot they go back to later, too. Phoebe gets a different high school reunion. Is that also the 10-year for Phoebe? They can't be that far apart, right? Because that's a few seasons from now. How much younger than uh, Piper is Phoebe supposed to be? I think people in their 30s love writing stories about 10-year high school reunions. I did not go to mine. Neither did I. I mean, granted, I was about 3,000 miles away from my high school, but, I mean, Facebook exists. I don't need to know what people from high school are up to. So... Or, I mean, I do whether I I already know what they're up to, whether I want to or not, because of Facebook, so... So I am an old, Mm -hmm. and um, my 20-year high school reunion theoretically just happened, but... I don't feel like I even got a notice about it. I don't even know if it happened. Yeah. Again, I feel like these sort of things are going to get phased out because the big thing about 10-year high school reunions is that you don't know what the people you go to high school were up to. But, you know, social media. Yeah, right? All of the people you went to high school with can try to sell you their MLMs online now. Yes. (laughs) So, oh god, I feel like that whole episode... Coyote Piper. Oof. I feel like that whole episode is going to be a time freeze. Oh yeah, absolutely. But I believe that will about do it for this week. Yeah, I think that'll do it for us. Our show's partially listener supported. If you want to be one of those supporters, you should head over to our website www.welcometotelevision.net and click on our Patreon link. We'd like to thank our current $5 and above patrons Beryl, Patricia, Sam, Cassidy, Alex, Alicia, Ryan, Mara Cruz, Rosa, Javier, Benjamin, Kyle, Kate, and Jen. If you want to help us out in other ways, you could always rate and review us on Apple Podcasts. It helps other people find the show. If you want to talk about this episode or any episode or any episode of any television show, you should join our Facebook group, Welcome to Television. We can also be contacted at I Love TV Zines on Twitter or at I Love Television Zines at gmail.com. So until next time, I'm Tina. And I'm Max. And this has been Welcome to Hallowell Manor. Welcome to Hallowell Manor.